Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist and uh, got a great show for you today. Uh, I want to talk about um, recovery and what people think it looks like. Does that make sense? It does. I get it. It's, because, it's all English words in a sentence. It makes yeah. total sense. So yeah. here's what's going on. Um, I recently had the opportunity to make a national TV debut. I know. I wanted to bring this up. So, uh, I, you know, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a reporter for the local uh, affiliate here in Salt Lake City, which is KSL TV. Right. The Today Show called, and they're doing a segment, and it's called uh, The Merriest Main Streets Across the Country. Mm-hmm. And so people submitted their main streets, and the Today Show picked out some and says, hey, we're going we're gonna to send a crew out there, and, and they're going to use local talent. And so basically you'd get the anchors going, here we are. It's time to throw it to Park City, Utah, who has one of the merriest main streets. And there's our Casey Scott, the KSL affiliate. And I've got the mayor there and I've got an Olympian there and I've got the whole town of Park City. Well, not the whole town, but a lot of people for six o'clock in the morning. Sure. uh, Behind me. And it was, I mean, it was like a Christmas miracle. And, and, And I say that in, because... Three years ago, I thought I would never have this opportunity. You know what I mean? I mean, for a lot of people who are reporters, that is... Well, most reporters never get to have a national... TV debut. TV debut, You know what I mean? Where you have a show like the Today Show throwing to you, and then you have airtime in every state... Around the whole country. Crazy. Yeah. And... And it's on their social and all that. I mean, it was, and so for me, I'm I, like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't believe that I'm getting this opportunity. Right. I mean, I thought that, you know, after the accident and after going to rehab, and I've said it before, and it, and if you've heard it, please bear with me, that, you know, life was just going to be ho-hum. I mean, really, that's what I, that's, and that's what I was okay with. And I was ready to accept it. Life is going to be ho-hum. Mm-hmm. And that's Okay. Well, it's better than the alternative that was going on at the time, right? Which is prison or death. Yeah. And for many addicts, those are the only two outcomes. So it's either fix it, mm-hmm. die, or go to prison. I mean, those are really your three endings. Yeah. If you take this addiction far enough out, those are the three outcomes. Yeah. Get better, die, or end up in prison. Yeah. And that's going to end up for majority of addicts out there. Yeah, I, that's pretty accurate, yeah. And I was one of those guys. Am one of those guys. And so I decided, I dug deep, and I was like, this is not how my story ends. I'm going to give it everything I got. I'm going to do whatever they say. I'm going to follow instructions. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to try to outthink the situation. I'm going to go, okay, let's do this. Follow instructions. Well, yeah, mostly. Mostly. I'm, okay. All right. I mean, there were guidelines. You know what? My life is now like- Now guidelines. So I, I, took, I took my son bowling on Saturday for a, another company I work for his work party. Yeah. And they've got those lane bumpers. Oh, yeah. That you pull up and it keeps the ball with inside of it. Right. But you never know where it's going to go. Pretty much my life, I'm in bowling bumpers. Yeah. There <laughs> you know you go. I'm just bouncing around. <laughs> Time to put up the bumpers. Here comes Casey. Put up the bumpers and let's just see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and I can work within those constraints. And, and I like that. It's actually that. a pretty good analogy, right? Yeah. Like, like we all probably need the bumpers up from time to time. And, 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 and so I, I've got the bumpers up and I'm now... This podcast has been going for four years. Yeah. Uh, over two million downloads. I got my job back on KSL where I'm doing what I really, really love. And I feel like I'm really, really good at. And I feel like there's stuff that I can contribute. And then I get the opportunity to do the Today Show. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying this to be braggadocious. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying is that the world is crazy. And it is wonderful. And it is beautiful. I and had to do a double take when I saw you. I'm like, Whoa. Yes. You know? And the only limits in front of us are the limits we put up ourselves. Yeah. Because if you do the work, if you put something, the mind is beautiful. The body is resilient. Uh, the People do believe in you and they will give you a second chance if you're being honest and true and giving it your best shot. I think you have to give yourself a second chance first. You have to forgive yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to realize that you can, you know the optimism has to kick in at some point. That's it's interesting that you say that because for me in my recovery, 
that is the biggest thing I struggle with. And that was the toughest thing to do was give yourself another chance Mm -hmm. to believe in yourself because you say to yourself, well, I had all of this stuff and I've lost it. Why do I deserve to have it again? Look what I did with it when I had it. I didn't, I didn't yeah. cherish it. Yeah. I, 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 I threw it away. Took it for granted, I guess. Yes. Probably. You know what I mean? So what, 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 I mean, I was lucky enough to get it the first time. Why am I going to get it the second time? Nobody can be that lucky. Well, it wasn't just luck, was it? No. Yeah. It, no. And, and I know that now. It's hard work uh, and it's putting one foot in front of the other and it's trying to figure out how to keep moving forward. As much as I don't ever want to quote my, uh, you know, little league football coaches from those days past because they said a lot of stuff that was annoying. Yeah. Uh, some of it was really true. They're and the same guys who taught you the five second rule. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Pick it up and eat it. Five second rule. Shut up, Wooly. The same guys that don't know math, you know, give 110%, <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing. You technically <laughs> can't give 110%. Yeah. 100% is all you can give. By the way, don't say that. It doesn't go over well. <laughs> um, but uh, the one thing that I do remember one of my coaches uh, saying was, um, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And again, I thought that was annoying. But if you think about it, you're like, yeah, there is such a thing as luck. Sometimes, occasionally, things just sort of happen in front of you. You mm-hmm. still have to do something with it. But but the reality is what we call luck is usually on the tail end of a lot of hard work and self-belief and uh, and help from others. But like you got lucky, I guess you could say that. To be standing there on Main Street, uh, but it wasn't luck. I know you. You've worked really hard since uh, your MVA and motor vehicle accident, and and uh, you've worked really hard and believed in yourself, and your natural optimism has kicked in. But even I had to take a double take when I saw that you were on the Today Show, and I'm like, what? What? Right? What's going on? I, it was. It was. It was surreal, and I'm very fortunate and very grateful for that opportunity. I wanted to ask you this. Yeah. I was saving this to ask you on on the show. Yeah. Um, in all honesty, because because I'll preface this with, uh, I haven't worked a ton with TV and radio people, but I've I've worked with several over the years. Uh, you are the least nervous uh, of any of them that I've ever been around. You love being on the air in front of people talking. Were you nervous at all? Because this is a whole nother level. I wasn't nervous, and I'll tell you why. You didn't look nervous. I wasn't nervous. Uh, I was a little fidgety at the beginning, and that's because we were singing Christmas carols, and then mm-hmm. right when they threw to me, they stopped. So it looked like I was just dancing and no one was singing. <laughs> I and wondered what you were doing. Yeah, so I was you were like, dun, dun, dun. the weather outside is frightful, and I was just kind of jamming along with them in my back, waiting for them to throw to me. And then right when they go, let's go to the local affiliate, Casey Scott, who's on the merriest Main Street in Park City, they stop singing. And I was, then I'm just dancing by myself. <laughs> What is going on? Which is kind of your personality yeah. anyway. And but. so I wasn't nervous. Do you want to know why? Because a lot of people ask me. Yeah. Because I've lost it all. And nothing is going to hurt me and nothing can kill yeah. me. Not afraid of it. Anymore. I mean, I can die. I mean, I know that. But I. Yeah. But you literally have lost everything. Yeah. And now you're back. Yeah. Well, some people might feel like, oh, I've got to be extra. No. Because you know. if. if what, what's what's going to happen? I might as well have fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to be up all night long stressed about it. My girlfriend goes like, aren't you stressed? And I go, uh-uh. No. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's another live shot, and I know the people, and I know what I'm doing, and I'm confident in myself, so let's just, let's just take I it and see what happens. I would have been surprised if you said you were nervous. Yeah. I, that's what I thought you I wasn't say. nervous yeah. and very grateful. And, I mean, it, like, it was one of those things where I'm driving down back to Salt Lake City, and I can see Park City in my rearview mirror, and I was like, that just happened. You know what I mean? Like, even sometimes I'll surprise myself. I'm like, I can't oh, believe that. It was probably that. pretty surreal. Yeah, that just happened. Yeah. I mean, you, I, from a kid in college back in 92 to 97, I had two sophomore years. You yeah, know what I mean? Might as I well was, do it twice. Yeah. I was in the communication department, <laughs> and to think that I was the guy that ended up on national TV yeah. for a good thing. Yeah, for a good thing you know this time. I, mean? yeah. I was like, this is pretty cool, man. Yeah. And I called my dad, and he was like, I saw. Yeah. I'm proud of you, son. Oh, I bet he was. And, you know, I bet I mean, he was thrilled. You know, my mom was. You know, it was just. Yeah. It was cool. So I, I guess I want to tell you is that when you do get sober, your life isn't just ho hum. Your life is what you make it. And, well, uh, you and, and and absolutely, it's a blank canvas out there. You know, we've had a lot of people come on the show and say, uh, initially, I felt afraid of what my life would be like without my DOC, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Like, like 
that idea of can I really manage life without alcohol or weed or whatever they're doing, right? And then these same people say kind of what you're saying. Uh, once you get into that, if you take life by the reins and you go for it, you can make much more out of your life than you ever uh, had to start with. I mean, it's real now. And uh, I think this is a great example of like your career has reached another level, but it was after you got sober. It's now that you're in recovery. And you're, I think, honestly, you're – you. No offense, you're better now on TV than you were before. And you were great before. Like, I loved coming and doing TV with you back when we used to do that. That was a highlight of my week. But the reality is you you have a more positive energy. It was fun watching you do that Today Show. It was was great. Let me ask our guest, Manny Lopez, uh, whose DOC was heroin and meth. What was your biggest hesitation of getting sober? Well, I think I think for me, my situation was a little bit different. Was I always wanted to be sober? I always wanted to to get over the addiction. I didn't want to stay in it. Um, what limited me was opportunities. So I didn't have a lot of opportunities, and so when I decided to get sober, um, I realized that opportunity opens you up for opportunity, right? And mm-hmm. I kind of think that relates to what you're saying. Yeah, right is. It wasn't just luck, and I like that you said it wasn't just luck because it's the hard work and you taking those opportunities and running with them. And putting yourself out there. Right. That's the voice of Manny Lopez. We're going to find out his story. You're listening to Project Recovery, a KSL podcast. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Willie. Our guest today is Manny Lopez. Hey. We heard a little bit from him in the first segment, but where does the story of Manny Lopez begin? So my name is Manny Lopez. I'm a person in long-term recovery. What does that mean, long-term recovery? It means that I'm in it for the long haul. Okay. I mean, it's a lifelong thing. Like, I didn't know if there was a, like, like after your first year, you could consider yourself long-term or if it's a state of mind or or what it looks like. I I took what you said as a commitment. Absolutely. Like, like maybe you've been, so how many years sober are you now? A uh, little over two and a half years. So you're two and a half years sober, but I like the fact that you, you say this is long term. It sounded more like I'm committed to it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, Commitment. Cool. When, I, when I'm committed to something, I'm saying I'm all in. And you were all in when it came to your addiction. Yeah. One time I was. And uh, where did your addiction begin? Where did you grow up? I grew up here in Salt Lake, uh, on the west side of Salt Lake, the Glendale area. Mm-hmm. Uh, my My family... Drugs were around, right? So it was it was normal seeing that. Um, when you say it was normal seeing drugs, are we talking marijuana? We so talk- marijuana was there. Alcohol was there. Uh, back then it was – you didn't really see meth or heroin, at least not in my household. What you saw was cocaine. Okay. And like you could – you remember seeing that at a young age? I do. And, and, and was it something that you saw that you were like, I want to try that? Or is that just what old people do? That's just what grownups do. Well, no, I, I, it didn't happen like that. So, so because of all that that was going on in the home, I have two brothers and two sisters. They're all younger than me. But we ended up getting taken away by the state. So DCFS came in, took us away. I was eight or nine years old at that time. Uh, went through the foster system for the next – Three, four years. Were you with your siblings in the foster system? In the, beginning, or in the beginning. In the beginning, they put us all in one home. I immediately started acting out. I was at an age where I, I understood what was going on a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, you know, you're not my mom. You're not my dad, right? I'm not going to listen to you. I want my mom. And the acting out got me separated from them. Mm. So from there, I started bouncing around placement to placement. I went from foster home to foster home. Foster homes turned into group homes. Group homes turned into juvenile detention center um, and that eventually led me to the criminal justice system Uh, when I was 16 years old I was involved in a drug deal that didn't go the way that it was planned and I ended up shooting somebody twice wow yeah so this got me certified as an adult um, and so I turned 17 years old in the adult jail and then they sent me to prison when I was 17 so you shot somebody twice did they live they did he did he let he lived and, and I like how he goes, the drug deal didn't go how we thought it was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think any drug deal really goes how you think it's going to go, right? Or right. do they? Or I mean, I don't know. I mean, 
as long as the exchange, like I get what I want. Like if it's a win-win situation, <laughs> yeah. then it's then it's perfect, right? <laughs> but I think. But what if Casey's, somebody's going into it and it's like I, I'm just taking this, right? Yeah. Then it turns into something different. I think what Casey's saying is the likelihood of it not going is probably higher than other deals. Like if I'm trying to sell a bike on right. KSL, yeah. it's probably yeah. going to go well. Absolutely. But drug deals may may be higher risk, right? Right. So yeah. before we we find out how you got sentenced at 17 as an adult. Um, do you remember the first time you tried drugs or alcohol? Yeah, I do. Uh, so I was about 12 years old. Um, well, I think I, I had sipped like a beer that was sitting around the house um, a few times. Same with cigarettes. Uh, but actually like smoking pot, that was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Right, My cousins were already smoking pot, so I tried it with them. Um, and I ended up trying meth when I was 12 years old as well. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's... At, pretty pretty yeah, young. It was. It was pretty young. At that time, it was just like a one-time use, right? And then that was it. Um, and then it didn't come around again till I was 14. And But when it did come around, that was it, right? I, I was into meth and that was it. I was, And like I said, I was on the run from placements. So I wasn't going to school, too young to work, uh, had nowhere to go. Or, I mean, I was bouncing around family member to family member if, if they'd let me stay there. So I had learned that if I had meth... I had somewhere to go because somebody was going to let me in their house that wanted it. Mm-hmm. So meth was your, your key card right? to get in. Right. How does a 14-year-old get meth, let alone pay for meth? Um, I just – I think the crowds that I was around um, just from knowing like – Certain family members, right, mm-hmm. that they were involved in it or my mom's crowd that was involved in it, right? If I got my hands on something, they weren't going to turn me away. Yeah. Right? And they weren't going to turn the drugs away. Yeah. Um, and so, so you're dealing at a young right, age. Right. I had a, I had an uncle that was dealing as well and he – Kick you down some. He would kick me down some. Um, and then I would make my money, right, what I thought I was making money. But what I was really doing was feeding a habit and finding somewhere to live. But it sounds like all that was sort of born out of this desperation to have a place to be. Right. Right. I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, we have a foster care system that I I think tries its best to help kids and families out. On the other hand, if you're the kid in that system, I can imagine, I mean, you can tell us, must have been a lonely, scary thing to be separated from your parents and away from your home and then eventually from your siblings. So that desperation to feel connected with your own people, your family, your friends, that must have been pretty pretty high. Yeah, yeah, because you try and find something to latch onto, right? That's where LAR comes in, the love, approval, and respect comes in that, that you start seeking out. Um, and I personally believe like a lot of addicts, at least in my opinion, suffer from LAR. Oh, I, I would agree right? with you. Love, that. approval, yeah. and respect is somewhere in there. For sure, yeah. And what you describe is what many addicts describe in their active addiction is called running and gunning. Yeah. Just doing what you can to survive. Right. And so it didn't matter what the task before me was, is I would do it because it meant life or death. You're 14 years old, bouncing from house to house. So if it's dealing yeah. meth, it's dealing meth. Right. And, uh, you know. Yeah, and- if anything else would have came along, it would have been that. So it's, so it's meth, but that's all you're doing. So you're using and dealing. Yes. And, uh, I mean. That's chaotic. Very chaotic. And so do you ever find yourself in trouble because of the meth dealing? Yeah, I mean, that was part of it. That was part of what ended up being the shooting, Mm -hmm. right, Um, that got me sent to prison. So so at 17, let's fast forward. At 17, you're convicted as an adult. Right. Let me me ask you a question. Here we go. Okay. What do you think about trying 16 and 17-year-olds as adults? How do you feel about that? I I think there were better options for me. I, I don't think throw me into – I mean that shaped my whole future. Yeah. Right? I think there has to be something different. Because um, now you're 17 and you're thrown into a cell with grown people. Right. Yeah. Career criminals. Right. Well, and then the gangbanging comes in, right? Because exactly. once you get into prison, you pick a side. You got to. It's survival. Right. And it doesn't matter what side you pick. Either side is going to try and manipulate you or they will manipulate you. Right. To do things that you're uncomfortable doing. At 16 years old, 17 years old, in my opinion, and I don't mind saying it, you're you're still mentally a child. Right. Now, you're capable of doing adult like things. I understand that. But and I don't mean you. I mean, people in general. 
Um, I think we need to take care of those kids, not punish those kids and send them off to jail. Even something as adult as shooting someone, that didn't come from a kid who wanted to shoot people. That came from a whole set of other issues we probably don't have a chance to get into. But it's a survival. I, I believe most kids who commit big crimes when they're uh, you know, 18 or younger – it's mostly because they're a desperate person and they need help. They don't need punishment. Right. So I don't mind if people disagree with that. I'm pretty strong on that working. And you can look at the neurodevelopment of a person. You know, we know that you're 24 before your frontal lobes are fully developed. And that's the part of the brain where we make decisions, <laughs> you know, judgment, reason, foresight, concentration, all those sorts of important things that would make us make good choices isn't fully developed. So I really don't feel it's healthy to, um, to put to to try 16 17 year olds as adults. So I was just curious since we have somebody here who got tried as an adult uh what you thought about it and I I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, no problem. 17 they send you to prison. Right. You said in your own words you had to pick a side. You had to pick a side and uh so I'm from this city so I gravitated to the people that I knew um right which was and it was and it was a gang and so and, and I stuck with them. Um and it just became a a, a battle. I mean, it, it seemed like I had more issues with my own people than I did anybody else, mm-hmm. right? And that, I think that comes from the manipulation, right? And you and you kind of know like you're being taken advantage of, right? But you have to belong to something, right? So because the like lone they, the lone sheep gets picked off. Yeah, hey, you can't be lone in in prison very well, right? But you felt like your own group of folks they kind of took advantage of you yeah i mean at at times at times it feels like kind of like a family right because that's especially at that age that's what i was searching for Mm -hmm. right some kind of connection um you know but as i look i look back like it was it was all manipulation it was all being taken advantage of and at that point the goal is just to stay in there long enough to get some new guys in that you know and then you repeat what was happening to you i mean it's a vicious cycle it's a vicious cycle when you get into jail, does that mean the drug use stops? No, no. Uh, in jail, kind of, yeah, but in prison, no. In prison, they're constantly seeking out ways to get it in, <clears throat> uh, whether it's a prison guard through the mail, like whatever you can think of. Somebody's in there trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, as we re- know, addicts can be very resourceful. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, definitely, it, it, you know, uh, so they're, if, if there's a way they're going to find it. Yeah. And it sounds like uh, they do. Right. And so I went in at 17. I got out when I was 23 years old. Uh, wow. Five year, a nickel bid. Six years. Wow. Yeah. So I I didn't have very many options when I walked out. They sent me to the halfway house. And in my opinion, coming out at 23, I don't think I was mentally 23 years old. Um, I, I still think I, like I, I wanted to be a 17, 18 year old. Well, that's what we call arrested development. You know, we have psychological and emotional development that is harder to see. We can see people's physical development, you know, you get taller and bigger and all of that. But the reality is those were really important formative years. If any person listening to this show today thinks about the difference between themselves at age 16 or 17 and 23 or 24, <laughs> you're not anywhere near the same person. But some of that depends on having the right kind of social experiences and growing and maturing. In your case, you got plucked out of society, put into a strange society in prison where it was survival. You no longer had the opportunity to do all the psychological and emotional development that other people your age were doing, you know, going to school, dating, having jobs, you know, all the, all the, any of that kind of stuff, you know, you, all those options are gone. And so you're just there in this kind of chaotic survival mode for those years. Of course, that totally, absolutely makes sense. And you're totally uh, proving my point that like, that is no good for a 16 or 17 year old. So at 23, they put you in a halfway house. Put me in a halfway house. Uh, I was out for maybe a month and went right back for a pro violation. I, I just said, screw this, right? I'm not going to stay at this halfway house. Um, 
started getting high. And plus in the halfway houses, there's drugs, right? Sure. I mean, and so so once I got high in the halfway house, I was like, I'm not going to stay in the halfway house. What's the point of getting high in the halfway house? I can go do it on the streets. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did. So do you think you made a conscious decision to do drugs to break your parole or do you just felt like, well, what am I going to do? I just – I felt like I didn't want to feel the way that I was feeling, right? The confusion, the awkwardness. I've been gone for years. Now I'm back. Lack of opportunities. Right. I mean it, when you're when you're 16, 17 years old, you don't have a lot of responsibilities. Um, but when you come out at 23, that's different, right? Now i got to take care of myself, right? And I didn't have the family support when I got out. Um, they were all on drugs. Well, now you are an adult, but you're not prepared to be an adult. Right. And you didn't have the support. And that's another big recidivism issue, whether it's prison or mental, you know, state hospitals. People bounce back and forth because they don't have the support, the resources, and the ability to take care of themselves in a healthy way outside. So you tend to kind of go back to whatever you were doing before. And so a lot of people rejoin gangs or they go back to using. Um, they don't really know how to make a resume, get a job, do all the things that would make your life stable. So that's, again, tough to just be kind of popped back out after those formative years are wasted. And there you are. Right. And and it, so after that, prison basically became my my residence. So right, for the next 20 years, a pro that violation. was the cycle, in and out, in and out, in and out. How many times in and out? I've been to prison 11 times. Wow. 11 times over 20 years. Right. Wow. Yeah. And so when you get a parole violation, they send you back and what, for how long? Uh, usually somewhere between three to six months, some, sometimes a year, depending on the violation. And then you get out, do they make you go back into a halfway house again? Usually, yes. For and me, so, for the majority of the time was in the halfway house. Well, let, let me ask you this. At, at the end of those 20 years, do you feel like you knew how to do life better in prison or outside of prison? I knew how to do life better in prison, which is why I wasn't worried of going back to prison. Yeah. Um, I, I had somewhere to go. And you knew, you knew how to get by in that system, yeah. right? But outside, you hadn't had the experiences that a person needs to know how to, what do we call it nowadays, adulting? Right. Be an adult, you know, like how to manage life. It makes, it makes sense that a lot of people get, unfortunately, caught up in that cycle of in and out of prison and in prison you got three hots and a cot three hots and a cot and schooling and go to school if you want right i mean and depending on where you're at as a gang member right so maybe you can get some programming done yeah so in and out for 20 years in and out for 20 years uh are you still using meth at this point because i know at one of your points you end up doing heroin i did so probably around 2016 um I started doing heroin. How does that get entered into uh, the situation? I mean, I, w- I was at a house with people that were buying some meth, and they also used heroin, and they had they had their own heroin, um, and everybody was smoking it. This wasn't something that I was really used to. What did you think about heroin prior to that? I I thought like that's those are the bad those are the bad addicts, right? Yeah. Um, Isn't that weird that how there's a hierarchy oh, of yeah. drug use? You know what I mean? Yeah. And here in my addiction, I thought, well, I'm just alcohol. You know what I mean? It's illegal. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm, I guess, you know, fancied myself on the higher end of the addicts. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I remember being in, 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 in rehab and they're like, well, no, an addict's an addict. You mean, you, right. can, you can sell it to yourself any way you want, but right. your addiction's just as bad as their addiction. So right. get off your high horse and <laughs> sit well, down here. human beings, we're pretty good at like justifying our behavior. And I think, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I was just drinking Bud Light. Yeah. And I wasn't doing that other right. stuff. Or I was just doing this. I wasn't doing heroin. But, but yeah, it's a way of keeping yourself separate. justified yeah. in what you're doing. But yeah. my addiction almost landed me in the same place that you were, prison. Yeah. Right. You know, so you thought heroin users were the, the dirty addicts. Right. And then, I, and then I went to this house and it was more like they were partying, smoking heroin. Right. Everybody was having a good time. And so I started doing it. I started smoking it and and I liked it. Um, It it kind of was a way for me to balance the meth. Sometimes it was too much. And so that became my my drug of choice. My DOC was mixing the two. Oh, trying to create a balance of the highs and the lows. Yeah, Because one is an upper and one's a downer, right? Right. 
And so you were just trying to even it out. Mm -hmm. And how long do you mess around with heroin for? Uh, So from 2016 all the way till 2020. Mm Mm-hmm. And at the point, are you still just smoking it? No, eventually it became shooting. How does that uh, transpire? I mean, because, I mean, if you thought the heroin were the dirty addicts. Right. And then you end up smoking and realizing it's not bad. Did you still have uh, a perception of those who shot it? I did. And even even with meth, you know, when I was growing up, even the people that were shooting meth, like th- those were they were like those are the real junkies, right? I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not shooting junkie, it, right? I, yeah, yeah. But you end up shooting. You end up shooting it, and and that came from prison. Oh, so right? you could find needles and heroin in prison, right? But you probably couldn't get away with smoking as easily in prison, it, and that's right? why people are more detectable, it. right? Ah, but okay. how do you find needles? Uh, people steal them from the med, like. Uh, the med room and things like that. Uh huh. You know, the people that are diabetics that are going to get their insulin, you know, they'll sneak them back. Yeah. But it's scarcity in prison, right? Like everything's a commodity. So probably those, those needles got passed around. Absolutely. And if you had a needle, that was like uh, your own income as well, like for, for getting high, right? Everybody wants to get high, but I'm the only one with the needles. So everybody has to come to me. So I'll let you use my needle, but you're going to get me high. Right. And uh, I'm assuming... uh, And you don't know who, how many times that thing's been passed around, right? And so eventually I ended up getting hepatitis C, and I know that's where I got it from. It was from sharing needles. Yeah. Um, Well, you know, we our guest recently on the show, she talked about... HIV. HIV, and a lot of uh, the desperation to get high, that, that addiction will fuel decisions that you wouldn't normally make. And so you end up using something like a dirty needle and you, you know, that's just, that's just a matter of time. You know, eventually you're going to get something like hepatitis C or, or HIV or, you know, those sorts of things. In prison, I know you can be resourceful. Uh, Did you guys ever manufacture needles? So like there was needles that, I mean, you're only going to get so many uses out of, out of one needle, but as long as you had the needle, the tip, right. I I've used ones that were burned into pens and we're using earplugs as plungers, uh, just different things like that. I mean, people in prison are, are pretty crafty. Yeah. If you're still with us, you're listening to Project Recovery. We're listening to the story of Manny Lopez and talking about uh, how prevalent heroin and needles are in prison. Uh, we're going to find out more about his story. Stick around. You're listening to Project Recovery. Welcome back to Project Recovery. Casey Scott, Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Manny Lopez, 11 times in the state penitentiary. Correct. Uh, What does the last time you're there look like? So the last time I was there, uh, I had got out on parole. So I kind of want to go back just a little bit. No, you go back. This is your story. I'm in. So about a few years ago, I decided I was done with the gang. Um. I had just got nothing but destruction from it. And so I had a daughter. I have a daughter. At that time, she was a newborn. Went back to prison, and that's what I wanted to do. That was my purpose, to be a father. Mm-hmm. So I told the gang I didn't want to be a part of this anymore. Um, and they didn't want to give me a pass? The, re- the, the respect that I see a lot of other gang members get that were – loyal to a cause and just say, okay, we're going to let you go be a family man or we're going to go let you go be a man of God. So when you go in there and you ask them that, are you asking them to leave you alone for the remainder of your stay in prison and you just want to get in and get out and get back to your daughter? Right. And they had different ideas for you. Right. Um, and and I, I was, they tried to talk me out of it and I was, I was committed to it. Um, all the gangs were on the yard at that time watching and so I just I pushed the issue, right? If you're not going to let me just walk away, then I'll just fight my way out of this the way that I came into it. So basically, and, and all I know is from watching TV, but if you jump in, you jump out. Right. And so a jumping in to a gang means you literally get the crap kicked out of you. Right. And then you stand up and you're in the gang. Well, if you want out, it's the same way out. 
and but they're going to go a little harder on the way out. Yeah, and it, it was a lot, a lot harder. So they jumped uh, you out. Yeah, I was stomped. I was stomped. My head was stomped on. I, when uh, when I when I went out, they continued to stomp on my head. Um, man, and that's how I got out. Was that an agreement ahead of time, or did you just throw down? No, I I just threw down. I I pushed that issue. First off, I I know they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Right? You get in trouble and then you get sent to max. Now you're in segregation. Um, if if you can figure out a way to accomplish a goal without getting sent to solitary, then that's what you're going to do. Did they do. offer you any other options? But the gang's also going to save face. You know what I mean? Exactly. They got to save face. I mean, you can't just let somebody walk away because then you got no power, no real And, and all the other gangs are watching. Yeah, they're like, well, let's see, let's see if they're getting soft. Because, you know, you're in a prison society and you see a weakness, they're going to exploit that. So I, See, I would be a terrible gang leader because like if you ask me nicely i probably like, yeah okay no yeah uh, my game so would they, not they had survive. to make a statement and you had to make a statement to get out right you, you know what i mean you had to prove that you really wanted but did they out. offer you right. another because, option because a lot of times you see guys that say i don't want to i'm done i'm done gang banging right and then a week later they're gang banging again right because their friends either reel them in or they get lonely and they want to be a part of that again uh-huh. you know the gangs can be a crutch that you lean on when you don't have anything else. But isn't it also a form of self-protection? Like now yeah. if you're out of the gang and you're still in prison, like who's there to watch your back? And so I watched my own back after that. Um, for me, I don't think – I mean when I when I just I reevaluate everything, I, I don't think that they did anything for me that I couldn't do for myself. Mm. I mean and by the time that I walked away from the gang, I had built relationships with all kinds of people in prison. You remember, I'm, I'm talking 20 years in and out. So I know all these guys that are going in and out as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm good. I can take care of myself. I don't, I don't need to be a part of this. I'm not a pawn anymore. Yeah. And, okay. so that, and, and I want to be a father. My, des- my daughter deserves me in her life. right? So that's what I wanted to do. And so that's what I did. I got out. So what happened from there was I thought, okay, take the gang away. And I'm good. Okay, I, I got it now. I was so wrong, right? Life got worse, right? I took that crutch away that I was leaning on, and now I had to figure it out myself. I had the addiction. I had all the behaviors. And so for the next few years, I was still in and out of prison, mm-hmm. right? Nothing changed. That's interesting. Does the gang uh, – like does that follow you outside of prison too? Like you were in and out 11 times. Obviously, when you're in the prison, you're kind of active with the gang. What about outside of prison? Outside of prison, I was active with the gang as well. So I'm from Salt Lake. It was a, it's a Salt Lake Street gang that I was from, and so that's who I would get out and go hang out with. It was was my guys. So but when, when so when you got so when you got jumped out of the gang on that last prison, I did not I did oh, not hang you, out with them anymore. You didn't. When I got out. And did they? But some of them I I would see like in passing and, yeah. and what's up? Hi, good to see you. But I'd go okay. my own way. Okay. When I when I separated myself from them, I really separated myself from but them. But you still had the addiction. Still had the addiction. You still had the heaviness of tw- eleven trips to the penitentiary. Right. Not a lot of opportunities. Uh, not a lot of growth. Um, did you get any schooling while in prison? I graduated from high school. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I started working on my associate's degree in applied science. Um. Yeah, I did. I did. And so the last time that I went to prison. I was in a stolen vehicle. I was in Murray and I crashed into another vehicle. When somebody pulled over to help me, I jumped out of the stolen vehicle and like kind of bumped them to the side and jumped in their vehicle to try and take off in their vehicle. Right. Luckily they had taken the keys out or I would have put a lot more people in danger. My situation would have got worse. But what that did was when I got out of that vehicle and I kind of bumped him to the side, uh-huh. that turned that whole situation from just the the accident. stolen vehicle accident, right, to aggravated robbery, attempted carjacking. Ooh. So now I'm facing multiple five-year-to-life sentences. So I get taken back to prison, and when I call and talk to my daughter, my daughter's three years old at this time. I call and talk to her, and she's starting to talk. Now she's talking. Right. And I'm hearing her say daddy and things like that. And and that was my like awakening of everything. Like, what am I doing? Right. You're facing so much time now, Manny. Right. What are you going to do? Um, and I knew I had to take this decision out of the hands of the Board of Pardons because my history at the Board of Pardons is not good. You know, 11 times in and out. 
they're just like, okay, well, you don't learn. Well, here's 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was what was coming for me. And so I started working my program. Right. And I, I went, I did the, the classes that I could seven habits for highly effective people the anger management. I went to the conquest program here in our, at, at the prison, which is a residential substance use treatment program, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I ran my program and I did it. I did it in an honest way. I was holding people accountable. Now that was a big, a hard thing to do. Right. Because now you got killers and guys that have been in prison for 20 years that are in this program and they're there just for the benefits of the program. Mm -hmm. And the benefits being they're not in a cell, being they're, they're not in, in a cell. Yeah. It's, it's a they're dorm. not there for the, the, the right, right? Reasons. The yard. They got yard all day. Yeah. Um, and I got into leadership. What I learned from that was that I'm a good leader. Right. And I can be a leader for myself and other people and go in a, in a good direction. And that's what I did. Um and then I was like, you know what? I, this, if, if I can do anything good, this is what I want to do. And so I wrote to Odyssey House. I got accepted into Odyssey House. Um, and I fought these charges for 17 months. When I went to court, when I went and saw the judge, I let the judge know, look, I've done everything, every pro, any, everything program-wise I can do. I did it in the 17 months, right? If you want time. That's all you can get because I can't do anything else. But if you give me this chance to go to residential because I need it so much, right? My history shows that I need structure. Yeah. Then I will take this opportunity and I'll run with it. Um, and he did. He sentenced me. He sentenced me to, to prison, but he suspended the prison sentence and sentenced me to 36 months probation uh, with the stipulation of going to residential. And so now I'm on parole and probation at the same time, which is you don't see that very right. You're either on probation or on parole. Yeah. Right. So this was an opportunity for that, a career career criminal. I mean, I, right. I, mean, I don't want to, you know, what I mean, but that's what you are career, at this career point. criminal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and he told me, I'm going to give you this chance. And everybody's telling me not to give you this chance, but I'm going to give you this chance. If you mess up, I will give you every day of this sentence. And how long was the sentence? I mean, it was one to 15 years at that time from what I pleaded to. So it would have been a 15-year sentence. Wow. What do you think it was about you that made him do that? If he was, if he was being sincere, which I'm sure he was, that everyone was telling him not to give you this chance. And if you just look at you on paper, that probably didn't make any sense to give you that chance. What was it about you that you think made him kind of go out on a limb and give you that opportunity i think he recognized the hard work I, I i really do like i would i would send him updates on what i was doing right every month or a couple months send him a letter send him a letter and i didn't know if he was really getting these letters or not i'm just going to assume that he did and that's what helped bet, him yeah um this, make this decision i can also think that the judge looked at you and looked at what you've done and then looked in your eyes and your demeanor because i look into your eyes and you've got a a, a a ring in this eye right here, uh, you know, and then a, a heart tattoo over here. But I see kindness Thank in you. your eyes. I mean, I really do. I see peacefulness. And uh, I mean, I, I think he looked at you and was like, yes, I think this guy is sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think your rock bottom was you talking to your daughter on the phone and realizing that it's time to break this cycle. And if I don't, this... Here's another chain in the link. Right. Right. And, and you know what was good for me as well? So I've been in this relationship with, with my wife for four years at that time. So when I went back to prison that time, she was still out here and she was still involved in drugs. Um, but before I got out, she made a decision that she was going to change her life as well. And I'd always been talking about this. Like I'd be such a good drug counselor, mm -hmm. right? Um, because of everything that I've been through. She went to the House of Hope. She graduated House of Hope. When I got out, she was doing the outpatient, and that's when I went in the Odyssey House. Mm -hmm. So I had that. I had her. Right? I couldn't be where I'm at today without her support and her making that decision. If she would have stayed involved in drugs, I, I can't say that I'd be where I, where, where I am right now, that I could have made that decision to do it for myself because I've been in so many toxic relationships. I have the love, approval, and respect need Right. That thinking error. 
is that I would have probably followed her back into that like I've done with previous relationships throughout my throughout my addiction. That's some really good insight. I mean, honestly, that I don't know if you recognize that, Casey, but from a therapist's standpoint, what you just demonstrated is some really serious insight that I'm sure you've had to work for. But knowing right. that about yourself, it, it, I'm sure has empowered you to, to keep doing what you're doing. Right. So you're on probation and parole. On probation and parole, I go to Odyssey House. I make a commitment to my wife. I'm going to run an honest program. So now I'm in here with guy, other guys from prison, right? Federal as well. Mm-hmm. And then people from the streets. And I'm from this city. Odyssey's right in my city, mm-hmm. right? So I go there and I know a lot of these people. Right in your own backyard. Right. But now I have to do what I said I was going to do. And so I started holding people accountable. And I wasn't going to be involved in, in the nonsense. Um, and I did it. How, I, did, how, I separated myself so far from everybody else, right? Which is the goal, right? The, the goal is not to stick with the pack. The goal is to separate from the pack, right? I'm trying to stand out. I got, I got to do – my situation is different than everybody else's. Mm-hmm. If I don't get this right, I lose everything. Yeah. And so and so that's what I did I, and, I, and I completed residential in pretty much record time. How many, how many, how many days? 91 days. 91 days. 91 days. What did you like about Odyssey House? The accountability, the structure, the discipline. Uh, it gave me a purpose. And then after you graduate in 91 days, do you do an outpatient program? I do. I stick with Odyssey. I mean, they give you the option. You can either go to a different outpatient or you can stick with Odyssey. And me, I I wanted what all these other people had, right? Because a lot of the staff used to be clients. Mm-hmm. I want that. And so I stuck with Odyssey. I remember one time I was sitting in uh, recovery and I was sitting down there and I was talking to a guy. I'm 45 at the time. This kid's 23. He's telling me what to do. I'm taking it as a shot to my ego. Like, how could you tell me what to do? (laughs) We go back and forth and I go, why do you think you get to tell me what to do? He goes, because you want what I have. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I'm sober. And I've been sober for two years. You want what I have. So you should probably listen. Pretty good right. answer. Yeah. Right. And, and I was like, you know what? You're right. Yeah. But it was an ego thing. I was like, you don't get to tell me what to do. And he's like, well, actually, I do because I'm working in the recovery <laughs> house. <and laughs> you, you're in. Yeah. So either you listen or I write but down I, this book. And I'm, But I like that answer because he didn't just say because I said so. Yeah. He, he laid out because I have what you want. Yep. And that evens the playing field in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Age is no longer... A factor, and in fact, what have we said for four years now on this show? Addiction is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter how old you are, how educated you are, how wealthy you are or were. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, uh, your race, gender, anything. Nope. You, you, when you're an addict, a great equalizer. Yeah, it, it equalizes or everybody. Unequal. <laughs> yeah, however you want to look at. It. But the point is, you want that sobriety, and he Absolutely. was right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I agree. You, you go into the outpatient program. How's your? Uh... I, I do seven months in the outpatient. Outpatient was a little bit harder than residential for me, and I think because when I went into residential, I mean, it, it had a structure, a prison structure. Yeah, now you got to find your own because you're living in the pink cloud, and now right. you're introduced into the real world and the back in world. this and trying to navigate both. Um, and so, I, me and my wife, we moved in together right into a brand new apartment for us, um, and then I did my outpatient. It took me seven months. Um, I started working at the airport. I was doing construction uh, cleanup at the airport for a few months. Um, took a week off and became a CPSS, Certified Peer Support Specialist. Got got that. And before I was even done with outpatient, I was shopping for, for jobs in the recovery field. Good. And I, I got an interview at a, at a program called Papillon Integrated Recovery Center. Uh, they were They were looking for a CPSS. Right. And CPSS are kind of new to Utah and they were interested. What is this? Right. And it took me three interviews. They called me back three different times. The first two times I thought they don't want a guy like me. Um, And then the third interview, they told me they were going to give me a chance. And so now I'm finishing up my outpatient and I'm working at a recovery program. Right. 
you are one motivated guy. <laughs> Thank you. You're sending the judge letters every week, which I think is brilliant to, to prove how dedicated you were. And then here you are already nailing down a job before you're finished with your probation. I mean, I, that's impressive to me. That really is. So many I, I people always, wait yeah. for things to happen to them. Right. And you're making it happen. Right. I always knew that what I was, what I was settling for, I had so much more value than that. I really, truly believe that throughout my whole life, right? Even when I was a kid and getting taken by the state, right? And and on the streets, like I knew like I'm I'm worth so much more than this. There has to be something, right? And when I finally started clicking like, okay, that's true. But if that's going to happen, you have to make it happen. Yeah. And and so that's what I did. Uh, Papillon gave me this opportunity, Um they made me a house manager, so I started managing the sober livings. I managed four male sober livings, right? Now I'm, I'm going and I'm UAing guys and making sure there's no drugs in the house. And if there is, you know, we're, we're dealing with those situations. Um, and then I started my schooling, right, going for my bachelor's in human services with a concentration in addiction. From there, I go for my master's. From there, for my doctorate. Those are the those are the goals. And my wife's doing the same thing. She's a person in long-term recovery as well, right? She works there as well. Um, that's awesome. This yeah. is, see, this is what I'm talking about. This, I mean, in and out of prison 11 times, did you ever think that your life would be this good? At one point, I did not think that, that I was capable, right? My core beliefs came in. I'm not capable of success, right? I'm not worthy of love, all these things. Um, but now you got to believe in yourself that you're not going to fail. Absolutely. I listened to the people when I went into treatment, I listened to them, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and now I'm able to help people in the same way, right? People that I see like, oh, I know what's going on. I was that person mm-hmm. and I didn't want to listen, right? And I wanted to do my, things my way. You don't I know came me. In, I'm right? different. I came in the room thinking I was the smartest person in, in here, right? I read all these books in prison, right? I know what's I, – I can do this myself and that's not how it is, yeah. right? Recovery is a community. The opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is community. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's, Connection. Absolutely. That's Connection really what it community. is. It, it's community. It, 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 it's finding your people and it's understanding and helping each other. And it sounds like there's been some people that along your journey have helped you. Absolutely. And I, and I still stay in contact with these people, right? And I still network with these people because I know if I go out there and try and do it on my own, it, it will not work. Manny, what's next for you? What's next for me is I'm just going to continue to do to do what I'm doing. Work at this program help people as much as I can. Right. I, I mean, I love when I get these calls and they're like, thank you. Right. Yeah. I've been working there for six months and I'm already getting feedback. Like your story is pushing me, right. Your, your, your proof that this is going to work, right. That success through recovery is possible. And so I'm continuing to do it and I'm continuing to do it. Right. I'm doing the next right thing. And that's, that's what I do. The next right thing. The most powerful words in my vocabulary, right, or I and M, right? Because what I tell myself, that's what I am. I am smart. I am beautiful. I am important. I am capable of success. I'm capable of hard things. So those core beliefs have really evolved, haven't they? They have. Yeah. They have. And now my triggering events are different, right? Lack of money is, is, is no longer a triggering event, right? Because I'm working hard and I'm saving up, right? If the car breaks down. I, I got a backup plan now. I don't have to go steal one. <laughs> and you know what you were telling us before we started today? You're in school right now. I am in school. Yeah. I am in school. What are you going for? Uh, bachelor's in human services with a concentration in addiction. And you have a plan for graduate work. Right. That's impressive, man. I, I, really. I You know what? I, I tell you what. This is a guy. I, you're going to get a lot more of those thank yous. Thank you. And the reason is because two things. Number one. Uh, nobody's getting anything past you. So if they're working with you, you already know that they're not going to be able to, to yes. get stuff past Manny. Number two, uh, you you are developing yourself into a person with the skills that can truly help other people. And obviously people have helped you, and now you're in a position of helping them. So your personal development is with the partly for the purpose of helping others. And everyone's appreciative of that hand up when we need it. So I, my prediction is over the years, you're going to get a lot of those thank yous. Yeah. Thank and you. I'm in awe of all that you do and all that you are, Manny. And I think you are amazing. I'm going to blow Dr. Matt's mind real quick because you know what else he does? What else does he do? He's a rapper. 
What? <laughs> I am. I Manny's am. a rapper. Manny can do it all. <laughs> yes. Manny, if people want to see your rap and, and, and hear more from you and, and maybe reach out to you and talk to you, where can they find you? Uh, my music is on YouTube, SL Manny Boy. It's recovery-based rap, hip-hop. If you want to listen to something that's going to encourage you, motivate you, inspire you to be the best version of yourself, come check it out. I love that. Uh, SL Manny Boy. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I love it. Well, thank you very much for stopping by, and your story is going to help so many. I really do think you're amazing. And thank you. And we are so grateful that you stopped by to share your story. I'm very honored and very privileged to be able to come on here and speak with you i really appreciate this opportunity and you've brought up some important topics today a bunch we could have manny back yes i would love that yep hey you've been listening to project recovery and in case you forgot project recovery is what it's a ksl podcast he's a rapper boy of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.